Many people who are descendants of slaves have returned to the continent of Africa in search of the historical and spiritual roots. But most aren't aware of a long lost Christian heritage and identity in Africa and in the Bible. Africa and the Bible, the river of faith, next on Day of Discovery. Hello, I'm Wentley Phipps. The cross appropriately represents Christianity. But for some of us, descendants of slaves, chains are our reminders of a less than Christian past. For many of African descent, the faith of the cross is viewed as the faith of slavery, the faith of suffering. It was my honor to know Alex Haley, who more than any other human being of our time, inspired the descendants of slaves to search for their roots. But what can we learn by going back to the time before slavery. We can learn much about the faith of our fathers when we follow the river of our faith back to the days when the Nile River was carrying the salvation story of the cross deep into Africa. These travelers are part of a study tour sponsored by Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. Their purpose is to look at evidence evidence of early Christian belief in Africa. Dr. Catherine Krager leads the study tour. My hope was that uh, particularly African-American people, although persons of any color or ethnic extraction, might be able to understand the importance of uh, Africans in the whole salvation history. I think this will be of his head. Though in her 80s, her stamina rivals that of her students. Arriving in Egypt on an overnight transatlantic flight, Dr. Krager immediately leads her students to a church, to an evening service held in a large cave on the edge of Cairo. The singing echoes around the cave, filling up the space. The experience is unlike anything those on the study tour have ever encountered. For they have never joined people like these in a place like this. These Arab worshippers are the garbage collectors of Cairo. In the light of day, several from the study tour return to the cave church. The sun reveals what the night had hidden, except for the smell. The stench of rotting garbage. Garbage everywhere, lining the streets. Garbage stacked in every possible place, piled on their rooftops. A city of garbage. The people search and sort through trash. Scraps of food are collected and fed to pigs. Even though pork is unclean meat to those of the surrounding Muslim culture. It's the meat of survival for the people who live here. And here, in a mountain right beside this community of refuse, open two large caves that have brought light and hope to those who come. Hope in the one who also suffered. Hope in his promise to return. The plight of the garbage collectors causes some students to feel a bond of fellowship in the suffering of their enslaved ancestors and a communion in Christ, who is their hope. Nearby, the study tour visits a landmark that gives a different sort of hope to the followers of Islam, the Muhammad Ali Mosque. Worshippers kneel on carpets facing the city of Mecca. Here, hope is in the mercy of Allah to weigh their hearts and deeds and to hopefully grant paradise. The Muslim commander Saladin built these walls to protect this citadel from the Christian crusaders. The walls are a reminder of the clash of nations and beliefs that have marked this continent for centuries a reminder of the danger when political powers claim the power of God. Dr. Roland Werner, a German scholar in African linguistics says, 
that most people don't realize just how early in Christian history people of Africa became followers of Christ. This is a long time before uh, Christianity was uh, preached to, say, the Germans or uh, the English or any of the Northern European uh, tribes and nations. This is true especially for Egypt, this is true for Ethiopia, this is true for North Africa, uh, as we call those uh, stretches on the southern part of the Mediterranean, but it's also true for the area that is now called the Sudan. In pursuit of the early Christian history of North Africa, the study tour leaves Cairo and drives to Alexandria on the northern coast of Egypt. Here, ancient streets try to manage modern traffic. The city opens up along its shoreline, revealing a picturesque skyline and colorful harbor with boats and buildings, reminders of the grand history of this place. Alexandria was a Greek city founded by Alexander the Great in 330 BC. Alexandria's harbor became a major center for trade in the Mediterranean. A 14th century fort stands as a reminder of a giant lighthouse that once stood nearby one of the seven wonders of the ancient Greek world. An earthquake buried its light and tower in the sea. What most people don't know is how bright the light of the Christian faith began to shine from this region. Light that helped to change even the Roman Empire. Alexandria became the second largest city in the Roman Empire. The remains of a Roman theater with its gray and white marble benches are evidence of their presence. Chiseled crosses mark the time when this structure was converted to a church between the second and fourth century AD. And from that time forward, many ethnically diverse Christian leaders across Northern Africa would help to shape and refine the foundational teachings of the faith they had come to embrace. Centuries later, and a world away in Boston, a man named Dana Gonzel questioned why anyone of African descent would be a part of the Christian faith. I never could understand why we as a people of color would embrace a God that didn't signify or symbolize us. It was even harder for me to embrace a Christ who had a Jewish background. But for Dana, finding the faith of his African fathers changed his life. And that faith even helped him to change from being homeless to building a shoeshine franchise and pursuing an education. Dana was never in my class. I just got a phone call one day from an individual <clears throat> saying that he wanted to work on African bishops. I began to see how much Africans had played in the role of the early church, um, like many people around me. Most people think that Christianity came to African Americans on the back of a whip through slavery. That's far from the truth. He had a particular idea, and that was who are the great fathers that developed the canon? Canon is the books that are in the New Testament. These people were from Carthage, Alexandria, and Hippo. These are great men. And if for the most part, these were fathers in North Africa, uh, Athanasius, Cyprian, uh, the great council um, determining who, where the canon was, was held at Carthage, the birthplace of Western Christianity. And what I began to discover was not so much that Africans had a role, women had a role, but Christians have a role, one that we all share. This is just Dana's passion, and he loves to tell his customers about it. He tells everybody he can. The waves of early Christian influence in North Africa also surged south into the region of modern Sudan to ancient Nubia, 
a lot of the European travelers met Nubian monks and Nubian pilgrims in Jerusalem and they reported to the West at this time, say the 11th and the 12th century, the amazing news that there was this great African Christian kingdoms and that they had met these African Christians who were with their dark faces and some of them had branded uh, the sign of a cross on their foreheads, that they met them in Jerusalem and there must be this, uh, this, this great African Christianity that nobody knew about. To learn more about the Christian beliefs in ancient Nubia, the study group travels 500 miles south of Alexandria along the Nile to the city of Aswan. They follow the Nile, the longest river in the world, and she reveals the silent gods of Egypt past, ancient temples and civilizations that drew life from her waters. Today, the river of Africa flows along the banks of Islamic countries. Prayer towers called minarets mark the Muslim presence village by village, city by city. The historic city of Aswan cradles the Nile. Aswan is the gateway to the ancient Christian kingdom of Nubia. Boats called feluccas with triangle sails glide upstream and downstream as they have for centuries. Here in Aswan, a German named Gerald Lausch will provide the study tour with more facts about the culture and history of the Nubian people. Gerald has helped the people of Aswan for many years. He served with a German clinic in Aswan. I think they were distinct. Similar, yes. The Nubians, we call Nubians today, they came down from the Nuba Mountains and occupied the Nile Valley and mixed with the Kushites. And here, some African-American students hope to find an ancient reflection of themselves and to wash away the misunderstanding about the origins of the faith of their fathers. Today, the faith of most Nubians near Aswan is Islam. Gerald brought Glenn, one of the study tour students with him, to a nearby Nubian village. It was amazing that most people thought that I was Nubian uh, and directly from Africa. The only way they didn't know the difference is when I spoke because I couldn't speak Arabic. My family. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so she invites us to come to her house, you know? Okay. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. It's almost like a Southern Heart Hospitality. You come into our home, you know, we feed you, we invite you in, you know, with a meal or something. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Wow. No, they are very generous. The, the least is that you have to drink something. Nubian homes are always ready for company. Tea is always served. The offer of hospitality gave them time to absorb the culture and circumstances of their gracious host. The women keep a modest distance. They invite Gerald and Glenn to tour the private areas of the home. At one end of the courtyard, they're shown a guest room. From the rooftop, they view the village. Other homes with courtyards can be seen. 
Nubian villages have always stretched out close along the river, their source of life. In the past, Nubian homes were made of sun-dried mud bricks. Today, concrete and stone replace the limited and fertile mud as a resource for building. Homes are painted with colorful borders and accents. This is a resettled Nubian village, moved when the Aswan Dam was built. Distinct to Nubian homes is a wall that surrounds the house, creating a compound with a center courtyard. Rooms along the wall frame the clean, peaceful space. Invited into the kitchen, the mother prepares a traditional Nubian meal. Bardo? Pisilla? What are the Yeah. So the, the, the food she's preparing is, is called Molokheya. It's a kind of uh, soup and sauce in, in, in one. And usually it, it, uh, it's eaten with uh, chicken. And also they have this uh, specially made Nubian thin bread. You cannot buy it uh, in shops. It's just done in Nubian homes. And it goes with this uh, molokheya. The mixing of soup is a reminder of what happened to the Nubian people. They became a mixed people group. One looks to see in these faces their Nubian ancestors, but today it would be difficult to find ethnically pure Nubians. But what is their spiritual heritage? What can we know about the faith of their fathers? What remains of the river of Christian faith that once flowed past Nubian homes? For centuries now, Islam has been the faith of these homes. The courtyards of Nubian houses are made of mud bricks, then completely covered with the fine desert sand, then brushed carpet smooth. Not even a footprint is left. And under the desert sand, not far from here, remarkable evidence of a Nubian Christian kingdom was discovered discovered just before being buried forever by the rising waters of the Aswan Dam, which created Lake Nassar that stretches 312 miles in length. But just a few days before they wanted to quit working there, they came across an uh, astonishing discovery. They found this fresco emerging out of the sand, and as they carried away more and more sand, suddenly they saw these beautiful colors, and they saw the Archangel Michael spreading his enormous wings, two and a half yards on either side. Over three praying men were standing in the fire, and they realized this was a depiction of the story of uh, the three uh, men in the fiery furnace, which we find in the biblical book of Daniel. Uh, they found over 160 individual paintings in that one church alone. And as this began to unfold, uh, the world started to realize that this was a forgotten part of African church history and that this was very important. What we now know is that there was a Nubian Christian kingdom that lasted for almost a thousand years. From near 530 AD, until the 1400s. The Nubian Christians, like Christians everywhere, believed in the basic uh, facts of the Bible. They believed that God had showed himself in Jesus Christ. They believed in the virgin birth, the cross, the passion, the resurrection. They believed that Jesus Christ would come again. But there, of course, there were some things that were, they were especially intrigued with, and one was the cross the cross being the symbol of God's victory over the forces of evil. And so we find a lot of crosses depicted and they're not seen so much as a, a sign of the passion, but more of the overcoming power, the victory that Jesus had won on the cross over 
sin and the devil and the world. Yeah, what is very uh, interesting in uh, Christianity coming to uh, Nubia is that uh, the uh, temples, the old Egyptian temples, the temples from the uh, uh, Roman times, uh, were changed into churches. And, and part of it was that, uh, for example, as we see here, crosses, different shapes of crosses were engraved uh, into the rock. And on the other hand, uh, deities depicted on the walls, they were defaced. Inside the pagan temple of Philae, a cross carved into the stone marks the conversion of this temple. An inscription reads, the cross has won. It always wins. One of the Nubian uh, manuscripts which we found actually is a praise of the glorious cross and it runs something like the cross is the hope of the hopeless, the cross is the life for the dying, the cross is the freedom for the slaves, the cross is the water for the thirsty, uh, the cross is uh, uh, the salvation for those who are lost at sea and it goes on and on and on and they of course don't just mean the cross but they mean the fact that Jesus had uh, won the victory on the cross. But after almost a thousand years, the faith of the cross was eventually conquered. Conquered partly from within, because the Nubians had begun to trust in the kingdom of man, to trust the political power of their Christian kingdom rather than God. The words of Christ were forgotten. There was no one left to wield the Christian weapons of faith and truth. And so, over time, conquest by those carrying the Muslim crescent brought not only a loss of freedom, but also full surrender of the cross. Even today we find traces of Christianity in the Sudan. Uh, one of the customs of the Nubian people along the River Nile is that when a child is born, uh, the mother or some relatives will carry him or her to the Nile. They will put, put water over the child's face three times and they will say something like, I baptize you with the baptism of John. Not knowing what that means, but it's a custom that has just been handed on through the generations. Another thing that we find a lot is that if a child is ill, they will take some oil or some butter or some flour and uh, uh, make the sign of the cross on the child's uh, belly with this uh, in order to ward off evil spirits or sickness. So the sign of the cross is still there and uh, there, uh, even in the language we find remnants uh, of the Christian times. Uh, their name for Sunday is Kirage, which is the Lord's Day in Greek, Kyriake. So they even call the Sunday the Lord's Day in, in the Nubian language nowadays. But of course, the knowledge of what all of this really means has been lost. Just before their flight home, the study tour visits an Arab-speaking Christian church in the center of Cairo. Headsets provide translation. And even though language may be a barrier with these worshipers, the Spirit of Christ makes them one one with distant brothers and sisters that means more to them now than it ever has before. One of the things that struck me in terms of the black experience in the black church is that often, you know, slavery is the first uh, time that we speak of, you know, Christianity being present um, as our experience. But this, this journey, this study tour has helped uh, me to connect with the actual roots of Christianity and of Judaism. What I love about this trip is that we're able, you know, and I think can be confusing for other people, is how we can say, I'm black and I'm proud, and I have a rich history, and that rich history is a part of the gospel. And some people might take that as, uh, you know, uh, ethnocentrism or whatever else, but I don't see it that way. I see it as mm -hmm. it's, it's pride in the, in the way that God has made us. And my vision 
is, you know, the implications that this trip has on how we do church today and how we relate to each other's body today is that all of us can say that I'm white and I'm proud. I'm Hispanic and I'm proud. I'm Asian and I'm proud. And these things are not divisive, but they're celebrating these differences. All of it plays a part in the body of Christ. What we've seen is that the faith of the followers of Jesus lasted for centuries. But we've also seen that the faith of our fathers can be lost. Lost because of outside influences. Lost from within, generation by generation. Simply by drifting away from the word of truth. My prayer is that Christian descendants of those slaves will now rest on the river of our ancient faith and become a collective voice of reconciliation, proving once again that the salvation provided through the glorious cross of Jesus Christ is offered to people of all races and all nations. I'm Wintley Phipps.